Hello and good evening. Yes, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Depending on where you are joining us from this evening, guess what? Like, I am excited. So, you're welcome to another exciting episode of Chats with D Facebook Live Series. I am your host, Elisha Dockers. And guess what? Cydia Chisongo is our guest today. Yes, Cydia is our guest this evening. Whew. Yes, so Cydia is our guest this evening. I'm very excited. Like she's one lady that respects her. Very, very punctual, always on time. You see? Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. My angel. Hmm. Let me. Let me my angel. My it's a pleasure. Oh to my be God. Here. My Thank angel. You. Looking beautiful. Huh? I love the earrings. Please. I have you to tell me those ones. Ah. Did that come to Nigeria? They are really nice. Wait. Okay. Nice? What happened to your hair? Thank you so much. Okay, you're ready. Okay, I'll uh, you cut your hair. I'll say bit No, I cannot do that. I respect my hair. It takes time to grow, so I can't just Don't be cutting it off. off. It's nice. Okay, Cynthia. Cynthia has been I shouting. Like I've like I've been so looking forward to today. Wait, let me use my so that I, I okay. know. Can you say something? Okay. Um one, two, three. We are live with Dorcas <laughs> yeah, from so, Nigeria. So excited for like, Cydia, I have set you up today. Hope you're ready. You're up for this. So Cydia, yeah, like Cydia yeah. is our guest today. Like I'm excited. So Cydia is my angel. So back in the house, Cydia is the lady that came up with this game concept where you have angels that actually secretly take care of you for the whole six weeks. Like it is an amazing game. We enjoyed it. It was fun. And guess what? I got like, I got a lot of gifts. Thanks to Cydia. Because if it was not because of the angel thingy, I'm so sure maybe my angel would not have given me those gifts. But she had to give me the gift. So Cydia, Cydia, Cydia. Today, see, Cydia, because of you, you have I'm to feel like... Don't scare me. I'm okay. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> so you could actually share to your friends and let's them watch from your page. Um, okay. I just shared this public um, so they can see. Yeah. I, I had to collect the. Um, yeah. So let me see. Let me invite um people. Oh, I invited you again. Can you imagine? <laughs> Okay, Cydia, <clears throat> since you are the game lady, we are going to play a game before we start. Hello, Cydia, are you there? I think she's back. Okay, I fine. Can I can, since you are the game lady, I prepare a game that we are going to play before we actually dive into the serious conversation. Yeah. So I have like okay. one, to, one to ten mm -hmm. questions. So this game is actually how much do you okay. think you know your fellow fellows? Yeah. Ooh, so I'm going to tell hey. you, yes. So I'm going to okay. I'm going to read out something one of the fellows said. So you're supposed to tell me who the fellow is and the country of the fellow. So let's go. So you have one to ten. Pick your first number. Okay. Ah, uh, <clears throat> oh, no, this is too cheap. This is too cheap. I refuse, but I'll read it for you. We must stand united together as a union. We will build Africa. My lady Rama. <laughs> yeah, from is that one from oh, that's why I said that one. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to say that this game would let's be easy, go. Okay. but oh, let's go. Okay. Ah. No. Should I cheat and give you another question that is tougher? 
but I will cheat. I will just read it. You pick the number. I'm the first in my community. I'm it's the okay. only female in my class. No, yeah. yes, she missed it. She missed it. She missed it. <laughs> I'm the first in my community and the only female in my class. It's not so Pendo. So I'll give you a clue. She's running a PhD. Rahim Rahim from Niger. From Niger. So Rahim <laughs> from Niger. She's actually uh -huh. the first female in our community to actually be doing a PhD. And she's the only female in our class. Mm -hmm. She always says that. So the final question before we dive into the conversation for this evening. So pick a number. Number six. six. Are you enjoying the game? Because I prepared this one just for you. <laughs> okay. I, I like this one. They make Yeah, so I think this people. one I'll give it to you. I dance well. Now I get okay invited to occasions to dance oh. Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> yeah you got that one so i'm not okay this is just me adding because i think this person seems to be very simple so let me just give you the last one i enjoy cooking so i don't mind cooking every day we I enjoy cooking. I don't mind cooking every day. So let me give you an idea. Uh, it was the beginning of fellowship, the very, very beginning of fellowship that this actually, yeah, it is Jonathan. You got that correctly. Yeah. Jonathan, in terms of, okay, just. Yeah, so good evening. If you're just joining us, this is Chat with the Facebook Live series. And today I have my amazing friend. Cydia from Mozambique. Yeah, that's Cydia from Mozambique. This lady is super passionate. She's multi-talented. She, she has like, she's a lady with so, so many hearts. She has a lot of stuff under her sleeves. So it is an honor for us to have you join us this evening. And as you can see, it is already exciting already. So Cydia, beyond the profile I'm going to read, I think I posted something. Cydia is a professional mobile phone photographer she's a video editor <laughs> she's um she's um oh oh god what the other one i think i yeah she's a content creator there was this one i remembered later yeah she's also she was also a chief um and chief kitchen manager like she has this strong organizational skills mm. very very strong <laughs> one like I'm just excited you're here and the fact that you're doing the amazing work you're doing in Mozambique and other African countries is super, super inspiring. And we are going to be learning more about our work soon. So let me just dive into Sylvia's CV. But don't be deceived, this is more than Sylvia. Like when I read, I was like, this is the humble Sylvia. <laughs> Sylvia didn't want to give MWF a full profile, so she just gave them a little of a profile. So I'm going to read it. So Sylvia, pardon me in case I mispronounce your surname. But I'll try my best not to mispronounce it. She's so good. And it's okay. Yeah, okay. It's Sidia. Okay, it's Sidia, yeah. but it's okay. You can say whatever. <laughs> I know you're trying to talk to me. Okay. Okay, I can skip the surname. So Sidia has more than seven years of experience working as a campaigner for social justice in Mozambique and other African countries. Currently, Sidia is a social impact director at Big Girls Mozambique a social enterprise that empowers young women through the design through design by rebranding menstruation and building a world where all girls own understand and love their bodies our biggest accompli accomplishment at big girl mozambique is the national menstrual hygiene curriculum that has helped develop that she helped develop for the government of mozambique <clears throat> Cydia continues to be passionate about menstrual hygiene management, but she is now transitioning and working as a campaigner and human rights consultant to better escalate the impact of her work as an activist. She created a campaign to call attention to the terrorist attack in the northern part of Mozambique. Cydia holds a bachelor's degree in education, which is her biggest passion along with the with other women rights. After completing the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders, Cydia plans to implement a school of 
Artism project to empower and engage young people in social and political change. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Cydia from Mo <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for this introduction, Doricus. Actually, yeah. there is one thing that I have to update that, which is okay. the fact that I'm not working anymore for Big Girl as the social impact director. By the time I, I, I sent that view, I was transitioning. Yes. So I have okay. done that. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about um, uh, the experience as well at Pico because it's like yeah. part of my journey, professional journey was at Pico. I spent that three years doing an amazing work with, um, along with other um, young women from Mozambique and other countries too. Excellent. We are still going to talk about it, but let's let's go yeah. to your activist um, work. Let's just go. So you are an activist. You do a lot of activist work. So which part of them? Um, so what social problems are you addressing? Social political problems are you addressing? Okay, this is a good question because uh, the way I started my activism, it's not. Um, the conventional way, I don't even okay. think there's a conventional way to start activism. But I see yeah. that many people, the way they start, it's because they have experienced something in, the, in their lives. Let's say if they were abused, then they decide to fight against these things. If um, they suffered from a certain disease, let's say, and like a rare illness, I don't know if we say that that way, then they want to advocate. Oh, if they have a child who has that, um that illness or oh, if they had an issue at work something but for me it was different because yeah. um when i started at the university i was just 17 years old and then i started engaging working with students at the students university association i started seeing that i actually enjoy working with young people and then one of these days i had a chance to go to um nairobi Kenya to do a training to become an activist. I was 19 wow. years old. And when I arrived there, <clears throat> I found out that there are other many young people uh, working to, to bring changes in their countries. And I was shocked because being a 19 years old girl, I thought that just by serving students, I was doing too much. But then I realized that there are people younger than me really taking yeah. seriously the issues of not only their countries, but like the continent in general. And by that time, it was just one week training. I realized that I had so much to do. And I remember the last day of the training, I, I told everyone like, guys, I'm going back to Mozambique, but I'm not the same person. And my English was like too broke, like was too bad. But people were able to like understand me and um, okay. I, I still remember the words that I used. And when I got back to Mozambique, I started trying to find out what is the thing that I want to do. Uh, I know for sure that I want to promote like so social change, but it wasn't clear for me what bothers me. And from time to time, I would try new things. I would try new campaigns. And I started obviously with education because I was doing education at the university. And yeah. not because it was just like a simple course that I want to do, but because I understand that in our countries, education is a serious like issue and we are not yeah. paying the attention that we need to pay. So for me, it was really personal. I started campaigns in education and I thought, okay, maybe education is my thing. But then yeah. <laughs> in 2018, when I started the National Solidarity Campaign, uh, to support um, internet uh, IDPs, internal displaced uh, people, but also to call attention of the government on the terrorism things. I realized that, okay, this is not about education anymore. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm actually like going to a different side that I never saw myself working on. And then I started like seeing, okay, so from all these campaigns that I've led and also led campaigns uh, to release like, uh, to fight for um, journalists that were arrested, uh, young political prisoners that were arrested. So 
with all of the things that I, I was doing, I realized that injustice in general, it's something that bothers me a lot. Yeah. So I, I don't define myself anymore because every single day I'm changing. And sometimes it's not, I don't choose the front lines. The front lines choose me. So I would say that I'm that um, activist who's ready to advocate, to uh, call the attention for the things that are not right. However, I'm very clear about the things that I don't need to do anything about them. And I will explain yeah. because there are many people, when I see that there are many people working on a certain issue, I don't go there because I think I can use best my abilities. I can use best uh, my voice and all the influence that I have for the issues that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, this, and that was the reasons why I decided to start the campaign for Cap Delgado. I see Rama here. Yeah, we are getting there. Yeah, we are getting there. No, be coming down, be coming down. Don't give the be coming down. Let's take it slow. Let's take it slow. We are getting, that is a very, very important aspect of your work. We are getting there. So take it slow. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Take it slow. So um, what I am, um, so from what you just said, it is more like you're the voice of the voiceless. So you don't want your voice to be lost in the crowd. So no. as long as a lot of people are there, you know people are speaking for this cause. But those causes that has lesser representation, less attention, that, that it is there, but it is not so visible. Yes, so Ramat is there. <laughs> yes, I told you. So take up their card. Yes. <laughs> that is not so visible. Those are the things that actually um those are the things that inspire you to push so let me mm. ask why are all of those things that seem so invisible but yet important why are, why do you think they are like is a major problem why are they so important to you because a lot of people are not there it's not a space people want to be there but you choose to be there to represent those voices so why is it so important to you to represent that voice or those voices Yes, uh, because I, I believe that we will always have problems like as nations and things like that, but um, it's important for us to make sure that everyone can enjoy their rights. And yeah. when I see that people's rights are being violated and are being respected, I feel like it's my responsibility to do something about it. The same way we are enjoying the freedom that we are enjoying today was because someone else in the past decided to do something about it. And even, they didn't even know that they would enjoy everything they did, but they did because they were planning for us. So this yeah. mindset that we have to do for others, especially because yeah. sometimes when people are in a certain situations, um, it's very difficult for them to talk for themselves. So you need someone else extra from the problem because it's easier for people to pay attention. It's easy for you to make the pressure because you know, when you're desperate and in the, in the, inside the problem, uh, you don't even think properly. The only thing you want is just to get out of that and you need yeah. people to help you get out of that. So I feel like with all the knowledge that I have, with this brain that I have, with the voice, mm. with the contacts, network, everything. If I can use it to help people, but also inspire others on what is to like campaign, what is to fight for other people's rights, then I will do it. And exactly as you said, when I see many people doing something, I'm not necessary anymore. I don't do anything because it's not about uh, people seeing that I'm doing something. It's not about that. Yeah. It's about doing something that is meaningful and will bring results. So, yeah. and other people ask if I do enjoy activism, things like that. Activism, it's very hard to be honest. And this is one of the things that nobody tells us about activism. It impacts our um, mental health and everything because you fight many people. The pressure is very high. Sometimes you're not sure if you are an, on the right way, but still you're doing that and you have to stop other things in your life, sometimes sacrifice your relationships, sacrificing your work. And I had to do that a lot uh, in, in, in the past. So it's not something that I would say, oh, if I had options, I would just become an activist. No, 
I am an activist because it's necessary because we need people who can talk on behalf of uh, the voiceless. So yeah. Wow! 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 This is inspiring. My angel. <laughs> Oh, this is inspiring. Like, you know, I tell you, like, I'm so proud of you. Like, I'm so proud of what you're doing and how you do what you're doing. So let's go to the how. Just because I know maybe there are some persons here that there are issues within their community and they're wondering, how do we voice it out? So mm -hmm. if you identify this problem, this certain issue, so how, did you, how do you go about it? How do you push it out there? Okay. What is the process like? Maybe I can give an example. I'm a campaigner, right? So yeah, as a campaigner, so what is the difference between being a campaigner and being an activist? Is there a okay. difference, really? Of course, of course. So an activist is someone that I, that identifies a problem and um, mm -hmm. will decide to do everything to help people fight for their rights, right? But yeah. they how they may not know what is the best way to do that, but they can be talking about that issue. They can be concerned about it. But uh, you're not a campaigner. A campaigner is someone that will identify the problem, will think what are the best strategies and tactics that we can use to bring the result. And most of the times you will be very creative. You will first understand uh, the roots of the problem. You will try to understand the difference between the symptoms and the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure. K State is proud of you. Please continue. <laughs> I was paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we can see. So you want to also to analyze who are the people in this problem that have power to solve these problems? Because sometimes you get distracted. You start yeah. uh, talking and attacking people that actually can't do anything. And what happens? You lose your time. You lose your efforts but as a campaigner you don't just spend your efforts without knowing exactly what is the impact of the uh, of the work you're doing as a campaigner also you want to like um influence other people outside of your network you want to know who are the people that they uh, are also uncomfortable with the same uh, problem what are the ones that can fight against you what are the ones can be easily influenced so there is like all these thoughts behind uh, mapping the stakeholders is what Leticia yeah. say yes so a campaigner will do all of this and will get the result so this is the uh, the biggest difference in the beginning I was just an activist but when I started leading campaigns I started getting better I started seeing, for example, <clears throat> there are times that um, I would use, let's say, I would use Facebook always. But then I saw that there is a certain public that I don't reach. So I, I understood that the public that I need is on Twitter. So intentionally, oh. when I am talking or campaigning about certain things, I will go and find out what are the people that I need. And if I know that on Facebook, I'll just target them on Facebook. If they're on Twitter, I'll go there. If they're on WhatsApp, I will also go there. So you don't, as a campaigner, you don't just do things. You first sit down, you define the best strategy. You also uh, plan for a strategy that will, will not put people at risk because people who support you most of the time can be easily targeted. So you don't want to call the wrong attention as well. You want to know uh, that um, you also want to make sure that you have a, 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 a nice team because you cannot do things by yourself. And you also yeah. understand the timing. Uh, you, let's say one of the examples that I used to have when I'm leading campaigns, people will come to me and say, oh, Sidia, there is these people on Facebook, they are attacking me, saying that this campaign, we're like getting money for people, blah, blah, blah. As a campaigner, you also need to manage expectations of people. You have to tell them, that's okay. It's a campaign. You will have people who will like buy your ideas. You will have people that will not buy your ideas. If you spend your time fighting with the people who are fighting against you, you are losing your energy. So what you do, you ignore and you pay attention to those who buy your ideas or those who are in the middle that need to be pushed. So yeah, it's a long process. I love campaigns. Oh, 
that's that, that that's very very brilliant like when you were talking i just remembered um dion's class about fractions mm. like the important was that you just need to identify these tr- um, fractions and also identify their loyalty their stake and how you could actually work with them so campaigning is just strategy you just have to be yeah. smart at the table before you go out so you you mentioned something about risks so i know as an activist you might be target for you might be target to the people you're most likely you're confronting or you're fighting so how have you like what safety measures do you put in place to ensure that you and the entire team everybody is safe nobody's exposed and have there been any time that you feel yeah you felt threatened and you're like oh maybe i should just stop the thing i'm doing it too much i'm scared have there been any time like that no i just wanted to share so that aspiring campaigners can also relate to it and say oh, okay it's normal it's normal to be scared it's normal but if you're not scared that's fine i understand oh oh how come i'm not scared i'm a human being <laughs> So, uh, to be honest, it depends on the type of campaign that you're leading. Okay. Yes, the type of problem that you're leading. Let's see. You identify a problem, education. Mm. If you fight, 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 and you don't target the government, then there is no problem. They will even love you (laughs) for (laughs) talking about it as long as you don't mention their name. Yeah. The problem will start when you target the right people, people who are yeah. responsible for solving that. So it's not all the campaigns, but of course you will have other people targeting you, but they may not be people who have the power to like, um, to do something really bad, which is taking yeah. your life, things like that. No. So each campaign is something different, but every time it has something political, it's really very hard. I will mention a few campaigns that I've led and what are the, the, the risks that I had. Uh, so there was this campaign to, a journalist were, were arrested in 2018, 2018, oh, beginning of 2019, I can't remember. Anyway, so I started <clears throat> a campaign uh, demanding for his release, things like that. But when someone is arrested, there is someone who is responsible for the arrest. Oh, very uh-huh. true. Uh huh. So when you start targeting people who are responsible for the arrest, then you you starting to like put yourself in a very dangerous situation because you, you normally these will be like police, will be militaries, things like that. You don't want to play with these people. So what they will do, they will try to scare you. They will try. Yeah to show you that you're wrong and there are things that can happen to you if you continue. So it's better for you to stop. So most of the times I would receive messages on Facebook, on Twitter, people saying, oh, Sidia, I saw your name in this government list, blah, 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 just to scare me. But I know they're right, but I pretend most of the time that I don't care. Also now they know my secret. So I pretend, but I hope they don't (laughs) understand English. (laughs) <laughs> no they don't <laughs> they will need a translator <laughs> so i will pretend i don't i don't care so i will continue doing my work but i have identified in my country and it's very important for activists as well to identify the type of governments that they have because okay. i have noticed that in mozambique there is a certain line that you cannot cross so it's an imaginary line maybe this is my like my instincts they tell me you cannot go beyond this here's where you have to stop Syria. so i do respect my instincts when i feel like i'm going too far i will not cross that line because i don't want to see what's going to happen i think that i yeah. serve people if i'm alive rather than something else there were this campaign as well uh, when i started talking about terrorism When I started talking about terrorism in Mozambique 2018, no one was allowed to talk about it. And in fact, the the people who started talking about it, they they would call us terrorists. And they would say that we are criticizing the government, we are against the system, things like that, nonsense. But today, everyone is talking about Cap Delgado. In past, I remember 
I would go back home. I was 22 by that time to go back home, like dark. And I really had the, the feeling that people were following me. I had that fear. I, you know what? We can say that, oh, you didn't see anyone, but as a human being, there are things that will tell us that we are in danger. And I had to survive and have that feeling for like one entire year. So the strategy that I decided to use was to, when I have a campaign and I get the results that I want, I stop. I don't go beyond anything. If something happens and I need to do something, I will do for a certain period of time, have very clear what are the goals that I have, the results that I want, the strategies that I can create, not to put myself at risk, not to put other people at risk, get my results and boom, I will wait until my next move. So it's like, you don't, you don't wanna push the line so far because um, maybe in other contexts it can work, but in Mozambique, this government, ah, okay, I, I hope they will not translate these things. <laughs> <laughs> no. They won't. <laughs> they won't. They won't. They won't. Anyway, yeah. and <laughs> no, so many, no. They talking won't. to other people and have a very strong network is really important. Um, your enemies, let's say, the people that you are fighting against, they have to know that you are not a random person. If something happens to you tomorrow, people will be asking what happened to you, will be blaming yeah. them. So I would say in Mozambique, I have a very strong network, Mozambique and Angola too. And I know like if something happens to me, even if people don't get the results or they don't get the answers, they will not just sit and wait for like the government or whoever to like yeah. come and say something. They, ha they have learned a lot with me on how to campaign. So I really trust my network. That, that, that is really beautiful. <laughs> so we need good network and we need good strategy. There was something profound you mentioned. You need to be clear on your goals. Yeah. And when you are able to achieve it, you move. You don't have, mm -hmm. you don't, the goals does not need to start. The result does not need to generate new goals for you or new mm -hmm. objectives. Oh, you move. <laughs> yeah, so I think that was, that's one key thing we need to learn. So let's talk about how Brogado. Did I pronounce it well? I did not. Hey, I have fun when people pronounce it wrongly. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I should. I have another title for it. When fear knocks the door. So I will not call the name. I will just stick to the title of your ignite up. So let's talk okay. about that campaign. <laughs> Let me say Cabo. Cabo Delgado. Elgado. Cabo Elgado. Delgado. Del. Delgado. Del 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 exactly. Del okay, so let's talk about the campaign. What actually inspired that campaign? Because I remember when you had your Ignite talk, I was, I was like, are you serious? Is this the same Africa I'm coming from or another continent? Like, mm -hmm. I was really shocked by the revelation of your Ignite talk. So share with us what actually inspired that campaign and what is the campaign all about? Okay, so Cap Delgado is also Mozambique, is the name of the campaign. Because as I mentioned uh, during the preparations of my Ignite talk and things like that, um, <clears throat> in 2017, that was October, um, we had the first attack in Cap Delgado province. Uh, I'm just emphasizing Cap Delgado because people love that name. I don't know why. So, <laughs> they, no, were, you. <laughs> they were the first attack. Police station okay. were attacked. And we kind of saw that information on TV channels, radio, radio stations as well. But after that, nobody talked about it. And yeah. um, I noticed that whoever tried to talk about it was easily targeted targeted and i also noticed that there were pictures circulating on whatsapp for like 12 months whatsapp mm -hmm. and also some facebook groups with people beheaded with people brutally killed but i didn't see that conversation on public and that bothered me a lot 
And I thought like, why is it that I'm the only person uncomfortable about it? And I kind of felt that I was the only person uncomfortable yeah. receiving pictures of people that you know, they're from your country. They don't have their arms, their organs are out. Like, what is this? I've never seen this. It was shocking. You don't want to see these images. You don't, yeah. nobody wants to see, like, trust me. I still remember today, ah, <sighs> okay. So, I shouldn't just be on the same side as other people seeing this and normalizing it. I said, you know what? I don't know what's happening because the government doesn't even talk about this. When the government yeah. go to like TVs, talk about whatever about the country, they will just say Mozambique is fine. And by that time, we were like starting all these investments and in gas and things like that. You know, Mozambique has one of the biggest investments uh, in gas in the continent. So this was the only discussion I was listening about Cap Delgado. And I was like, no, there's the other issue. Why is it that we're not talking about the other issue? Yeah. How come you're talking about these investments in a province where the people from that province are being like displaced? For the, from their communities and nobody's doing anything. And I was like, you know what, that's okay. So I started talking to a friend of mine and I told them, I told them listen, there is this issue here. Uh, can we do something about it? And they were, they were like, Sidia, definitely we need to do something about that. And I said, okay, I'll start just with a Facebook post. So I, 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 I prepared a post was just one paragraph and i remember the beginning i said something like mozambicans we cannot pretend we don't know what's happening in capital god exactly in these words and then i said blah 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 and then i used an hashtag to finish and i said cap delgado is also mozambique it went viral it was the first time that i saw thousands of shares on my facebook account and i never saw that wow. yeah people were like so shocked and concerned and i was like why is it that people are sharing this? I started thinking, maybe they don't know. Or the ones yeah. that knew they didn't have the courage to start, so now they feel empowered, they feel motivated, encouraged to, to do it. And I said, you know what, I will not stop. Many people were texting me saying, see that this is too dangerous. You cannot talk about terrorism. There is no terrorism in Mozambique. You know the government wants to close the business. If you come with these terrorism stories, it will scare investors. And this is going to be a huge problem for you. But when I start things, I go until the end. So I couldn't yeah. start up anymore. I started strategizing. And one of the things that I saw was that <clears throat> whenever terrorists would go to a certain village, they would displace people, they will burn houses, they will kill people, and people will go to other uh, districts, other communities with nothing. And there were nobody there to receive them. In fact, there were like religion institutions, like Muslims and also Christians, who would do like uh, uh, support some IDPs. But I thought like, this is not enough. How come we are letting just uh, some institutions to take care of our people as a country, we should be able to be very well organized and also acknowledge yeah. that there is a, a challenge, there is a serious problem and Mozambique doesn't have the capacity, not even the knowledge. This is something new. Whatever is the strategy that my government were using since 2017 to 2018 was clear to me that was a wrong strategy. For me, we had to change it like yesterday. So I said, I will not stop because they are doing things wrong. And we have to think about different ways. And one of the things that I wanted by calling the attention was to make sure that the government will first recognize for Mozambicans. Second, look for support in the region because you cannot help someone who doesn't recognize that they have problem. So I started yeah. like, uh, not only voicing for Mozambicans, but also for, for, for outside. I was like saying, you, you have to make pressure to the government of Mozambique. So one of the ways that I used to promote and make sure that people involved in the campaign were safe was by collecting donations. Because I, know, I knew Mozambicans have good hearts. If I tell them there are people somewhere else uh, needing clothes, needing food, they will mobilize themselves. So I, I started saying that we have to support internal displaced people. I would remove the political parts in uh, the, 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 the way I was approaching them so that they would feel more comfortable contributing. And I remember 
in 2019, I organized the first public event it was very dangerous in all the provinces in the country. Wow. Donations. I collected so many things that I couldn't even send to Cap Delgado because I didn't have car. So this is why it's important. <laughs> There's an activist, has a campaigner to also think about the systems. We were discussing that. You need to definitely yeah. have a place. And then I didn't have also a place to store them because I thought people are too scared. They are too afraid. They will not show up. But guess what? People showed yeah. up. They came. I to make other campaign collecting money to pay the cat to like go from province to collecting donations so activism <laughs> it's not that safe but sometimes it's fun but it's only fun when yeah. we are here now talking and i look back and i'm yeah. like but when you're like on that uh, situation when you're on the dance floor it is not fun yeah but now i'm oh, like <laughs> <laughs> so, it's... Well, continue are you done no you've not finished oh the campaign you've not finished, you've oh, not finished. We need... no no they need to hear the full story like the story you told us that blew off of our seat <laughs> so we need to hear the... yes we need to get to the end of the story you cannot just start um stop me doing no don't do that okay okay so when I started uh, collecting the donations, I saw that people are willing to do something about it, but in a way that is safe for them. So what yeah. I did to like divide, this is one of the things that is very complicated as well when you're an activist or a campaigner, because you have to be able to wear different hats. You have different publics, let's say audiences, and yeah. you have to please all of them. If you are too like, aggressive or like fight too much the government, there are people that will dislike you. If you're like too soft, you will have a certain type of audience as well. So during my campaign strategy, I had to balance all of this and have other people wearing different hats. If I had to be more like political, uh, uh, in like, making sure that i want to talk about this i want to talk about this thing that the president said because he cannot just go on tv and say that mozambique it's okay i think it is wrong with that so i would have different groups some of them would go on tv and talking about just collecting collecting donations and my work would be talking to like international media and, and like fighting the government of mozambique so we had all these different strategies while inside you're like being a little bit soft outside you're like doing things in a way that will bring you the results that you want uh, it's very interesting that's why i was saying like being a campaigner it's about strategy you have to think all the time keep thinking so um when i started the collecting donations many people started talking about the cup delgado and they started wow. using the hashtag cup delgado is also mozambique it's not even yeah. it's not only fun in english it's also interesting in portuguese because people would ask me so why is it that you say cup delgado is, is also mozambique isn't it obvious that cup delgado is also mozambique but for me no it wasn't because you cannot say that you have 11 provinces and then you leave as if you had 10. so i wanted to remind yeah. people that this country has 11 provinces and one of them is that one that you're pretending is like everything in peace blah 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 so <clears throat> many people started even to use it not even related to me i remember uh like walking on the streets seeing oh. in cars people writing things like Cap del yeah. is Olympic, people buying t-shirts and i would see them on the streets walking with uh the slogan here and i would say they don't even know I started this campaign. So that really showed me that the campaign was going like extra. I would see organizations also organizing their events and just writing like Cap Delgado is also Mozambique. Yeah. And <clears throat> one of the things that I always told myself is that protagonism kills everything. So I never cared about it. I always wanted people to own it. I didn't want a campaign to become serious thing. I wanted it to be like general concern. So in 2019, for the first time, uh, the government of Mozambique, uh, I mean, the, the president, um, he, he just said something like, Mozambicans, 
we have all to come together and solve the issue in Cabo Delgado. And I was like, oh. yeah. That was the first time that we had like the government uh, acknowledge. Like, yeah. That. And I said, okay, we will continue this work. <laughs> so we started, we continued with the campaigns and everything. Whenever we had like major attack, like um, terrorists taking over an entire village, we would launch another phase of the campaign, collecting donations. Collecting donations was my way to bring people to the conversation because I knew they come easily. They don't like, Mozambicans, they don't like confrontations most of the times. They are scared. They don't want to look like they are choosing sides, things like that. So you want to you wanna call people in the right way. So one of the goals, as I mentioned, was to call the attention of the region and also like internationally. And uh, I can't remember exactly the month we had the government of Mozambique announcing that they had taken that issue of Cap Delgado to start their conversations. And I was like, yes, this is exactly what we want. Yeah. And then uh, they also recognized that the AU was talking about it. And I said, yes, this is exactly what And other like international media, they were reaching out to us saying, listen, we want to know about Cap Delgado. Your campaign is amazing. Can you just tell us what you need, how we can support? So I started seeing that, okay, all that movement that I started in 2018, along with um, other activists that are actually here, they did an amazing yeah. work. It's giving results. So that's how uh, I felt like I was going to to the right way and uh officially i have stopped the campaign for the reasons that i mentioned in the beginning today yeah. any mozambican can talk about cap delgado without fear without anything and we have like thousands of people now in cap delgado working for cap delgado so i feel like yeah. there's enough attention already and it's the perfect time for me to look for other things that I can do to continue inspiring change in Mozambique. It's not that it doesn't bother me anymore, but it's because all the goals that I wanted to, I achieved. And one of the things that guides myself as an activist, it's knowing that I will only put my voice where there are no voices. And in this issue here, we have enough voices already. My angel talks a okay. lot. <laughs> yeah that's very beautiful like super super excellent i remember there is part of your ignite talk like you know you, you do great you're doing great and i'm super proud of you like i'm proud to be your angel anytime anywhere yeah <laughs> so, there is part um of your ignite talk where you said um in case you don't know what an ignite talk is i think it's mm -hmm. a five minute um is, will i call it pitch yeah, let's let's yeah, see. Yeah, I think it's a five minute pitch. I don't mm. know that it is uploaded yet on YouTube, but I'm very sure that it's good. It's supposed to be it's not yet on YouTube. No, I, I think they would have told me. Kansas would have told me because they no, would it's like the that they're supposed to. They do yes, it. But I think so, they will mention the university and the university would definitely tag me. Okay, okay. So we're actually looking forward to it being uploaded. It's actually a beautiful, beautiful talk. It's Cedia's five minute talk about. And the theme is um, when fear knocks the door. Am I correct? Yeah, when fear knocks our doors. Okay, when fear knocks our door. So there's this part of your Ignite talk where you said, um, today, it's, um, today it is Mozambique. Tomorrow it can be other countries. So let's just talk about it. Like the insecurity in Africa and the mm. impact it's actually having on us as a people. So, what do you think? Like campaign worked. Like you brought the attention, but there's a lot of injustice that is going on in certain regions of our continent that is, people are even afraid to talk about. It, people are not talking about it. Maybe somebody from that part of the world or part of that continent might be watching. So what do you think we could actually drive our attention to all of this injustice and how to also move for peace? Because peace is what we need at the end of the day. So how can we drive peace in our continent with these two <laughs> insecurity um, issues on the height? I would say the first thing is to recognize that terrorism 
and extremism violence, it's a real threat to the continent. Because you see, yeah. what happened to the government of Mozambique when we hide it? Nothing changed. Nothing. We actually missed the opportunity to go get trainings, get preparation, get everything, just because we were distracted with other things. So as a continent, we have to acknowledge that. If you see the number of countries that are being affected by extremism violence, it's very yeah. scary. And the number is not decreasing. It's, it's like, it's growing. It's going so, up. It's, exactly. So definitely when I say today is Mozambique, tomorrow is, can be your country. Of course, you don't mind because you're already facing that, <laughs> Nigeria. But, <laughs> but no, other, it's true. Huh? But other countries, they have to be prepared because these things, is, it's like going down. And you know what? When we see also the number of people who like, join uh and who radicalize and things like that you will see there is young people and yeah. the majority number that we have in the continent young people as well and young you, people what are the conditions that these young people have it's not good it's not good young people are, are vulnerable so every time you have people in a situation of, of vulnerability you are opening your doors for an any many things to come so oh. unemployed people the injustice that we have in other our countries the social inequalities um, poverty all of these things we have to address them because um, when it comes to like extremism violence that is we can we will not find just one reason and say is this one the intervention mm -hmm. should be like uh, a holistic intervention you want to know that people have uh basic living conditions first you want to know that you have fair governments you want to know that you are promoting justice you want to know that people are having like peaceful conversations they have uh opportunities and space also to express themselves because most of the times or maybe sometimes when people go to violence it's because they don't have enough time to talk to sit down and see what are the things that are going wrong and also one of the aspects that it's important is to pay attention to the signals the case of mozambique most of the researchers they show that populations in cap delgado they started reporting about groups radicalizing years wow. ago who did pay attention nobody because first we didn't even know what radicalization is People don't, don't know how to see, uh, or they don't know how to identify when young people are getting uh, deviated, they are getting uh, different behaviors, things like that. So you want to pay attention to the community. We have a government for, for what? We have a government to, to oversee, to like see if things are going right, if are not going right, to facilitate our conversations in community and just not ignore people because you don't want to, because you don't want people to think that, ah, you're against religion. No. So you see the problem that we have today because we didn't want to have clear and fair conversations. And in the beginning, uh, all these, uh, all these um, issues, people tried to make us believe that was just religion. But today we know that there is things related to business as well. So yeah. there are many things going on that. And we, if we also see what are the countries that are affected, we see that there are mineral resources there that people want yeah. to so there is no one answer that we can have for this issue but definitely trying to remove other distractions and get getting like transparency is very important as well people want to say well, you can't just say that you're receiving um investments there are money coming people know nothing about that and you are in their province let's say and all the the expectation and hope to change the entire narrative economic narrative of all the country is in one province but people from that province know nothing about the business that is going on so mm -hmm. how do you expect people to it's very hard you know it's very hard there are a lot of things but definitely putting people first you remember this pitch yeah. putting people first this is very important you cannot go wrong when you do that 
But yeah. when you go other way, ah, uh ah. -uh. You see, even when uh, the, the attack started in Mozambique, by pretending nothing is happening and you're not helping people, you're showing them that they are not important, that the business is more important than them. Important. Yeah. So you don't lose, people don't have many things to lose. They have lost, they lost already. They lost their houses, they lost their families, their parents, things like that. What else? And also, Cap Delgado is one of the province with the high rates of poverty. People, uh, mm. I don't know, Say that in, in, in English when people don't know how to read, how to write. So one of the they highest grades no. is also there. So you see, there are a mix of many things. I will not have like a proper answer for you, but if I could do anything, I would definitely make sure that people come first, that we reduce, reduce the social inequalities and uh, also transparency and we make sure that people have access to information and they have enough spaces to be talking about issues that bother them and they can find solutions without feeling judged without uh fear so yeah it, it, it's a very interesting conversation i mean i don't know how we have as young young africans we're planning things and we're not paying attention to that but you know what i don't want to blame other people because before yeah. like this thing happened to Mozambique. I was also thinking that this was a Nigeria thing until it happened to my country. So if I had had have had a chance to listen to other people talking about it and yeah. telling them yeah, pay attention, this is coming, ah, we could have been so much better prepared. You know what? I remember in the beginning, I think it was in 2019, I actually had like, calls with some nigerian people working supporting okay. like uh idps as well because i did have no, I, I didn't have any knowledge and i wanted to know how can we do and you know what the guy said the guy said ah you better save your energies <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think, and now i know he was right you know the attack started in 2017. Until now that we're talking, the attacks are still going on. And Nigeria, I think it started in 2012. Until now, it's there. So he said, sister, I know you want to do many things, but just calm down a, a little bit. Terrorism and extremism violence, it's not something that yeah. disappears tonight morning. You have to be patient. Yeah. He gave me so nice tips that I was like, I'm lucky because I met someone who was able to like prepare us, things like that. But when people don't have access to information and um, a good network, they can like fail as well and they don't know what they can do. At least today, other people know that if something happens in their countries, they can ask for information uh, with others who have been affected like, uh, for a while, it has Mozambique, Nigeria, Cameroon, and other countries. Like South Sudan. Mm. Who <sighs> are <laughs> like it is just there, but it is it is where. So, like I can't believe it. Like we've been discussing this this for like close to an hour now like seriously and we've not even gone deep like my question list is still long what are we going to do about it we still have around like 30 <laughs> minutes i will i i promise yeah. i will try to be like very concise and straight to the point no, 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 no problem no problem i'm actually enjoying you and i know that a lot of people are too and we are learning a lot from you like I have zero idea about campaigning, but today I think I can even teach campaigning as a course because yes, I have a good teacher. Talk about campaign. Think that it's not only an activist that can run a campaign. Anybody can run a campaign. Yeah. So even at you, your office, if you see that there is this issue, then you start thinking, what are the best ways that we can do to bring people together, to bring this change, to bring these things? You don't have to fight against the government. Maybe you are fighting yeah. against like community leaders. You, maybe you're fighting against men, against women who are doing wrong things. So there is always something that we can do. And for me, I find campaign the best way to bring the results that I want. Because I'm not the type of person who identifies the problem and just look at it. No, yeah. I identify a problem. I'll just 
do everything. That's why sometimes I get off on social media because if I keep seeing problems and I don't have the time and energy to fight and do something, I prefer not even to get involved. And you have to see my face all the time when I see a problem and I'm like, ooh, this could be a huge campaign. But then I have to say, Sidia, you have other things to do right now. You cannot do a certain campaign. So, and maybe this can explain also because other people say, oh, Sidia, sometimes you, we don't see you too active right now. Campaigns, there are, are things that take so much energy from you. That's why you want breaks. Because when you start a campaign, you have to put all your energy. And a campaign works with energy. Once you are like relaxed, then your campaign, nobody talks about your campaign. But if you're like boom, 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 people can feel the energy. They can feel the vibe like, oh, this is a nice move. When you stop, everything stops with you. That's why when I have other like work and professional, professional work to do, then, and I know I will not be able to fully get involved on my campaign. I don't even start it. I just relax and I don't feel guilty because I'm also in my professional work. I'm doing something to bring change. And as you already know, I'm not the type of person who feels like I have to impress other people. I just do what I feel yeah. that is necessary to be done. So yeah, yeah, whenever this is the time, I'll just do it. Yeah, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, we talk a little bit. I'll still come back to your um, the work you're doing as an activist because I have like a few questions for you on that lane. But let's talk a little bit about um, your work with Big Girl Mozambique. Yes, mm -hmm. because I know there might be some persons here who are very interested in the girl child or the Mestra hygiene. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the Big Girl. Um, the Big Girl. Um, yeah, sorry. sorry I My, need to look at it. Don't worry. Yeah. I, I got your the back. Big girl. Yeah, so you said you created um, a national hygiene, um, menstrual hygiene curriculum. So what actually inspired that? What need did you identify that you just, okay, we need to do this for the girl? Okay, so when I joined Beagle in 2019, menstrual hygiene has never been like something that bothers me. I actually... Never thought about it. Nobody thinks that women struggle to manage their menstruation. Just because I do have access to menstrual uh, products monthly. I used to think that everyone else have the same uh, resources that... Yes, uh, yeah. But when I started at Beagle, I realized that, you know what? There are so many young women, uh, adolescents and like women who don't have access to the same options that I have, but also they don't have access to knowledge about menstruation. There are people who go to, I don't know how to say it in English, menopause, when you stop like menstruating when you're older. Menopause. So that they reach that, um, that these phase in their lives but still, they don't know anything. Oh, like the basic about menstruation. Why is it that you must wait? You don't know also uh, how our reproductive system is and what is the relation with the male reproductive system? What are the ways that you can manage uh, and things, for example, that we, we used to see at school when a girl has cramps and then the teacher will say, oh, go and sit uh, because you have to rest. But in fact, when you start learning how the body works, you will find out that it's the opposite. When you have cramps, you have actually to exercise because that can help your body to relieve. So I started seeing yeah. ah. So why is it that we don't have access to all this information? And um, I got passionate about the idea of Beagle. I think initiatives like that are so inspiring. It started with um, a Colombian woman uh, that is like oh. a for me. She's a woman. Um, uh, by the time she was living in the US, and then she decided to come to Mozambique and start the project. Yeah. I'm fascinated seeing that there are. She's a designer, and one of the uh, ex, one of her experience, she managed. She had the opportunity to go to. I think it's Uganda, 
and she found that that there is a problem there and as a designer she thought about something that could help girls which is a period panty was a pad i think to help girls manage their menstruation in a way that it's not like so hard it's not disposable they can use the same pad but then that if she does that then she's creating another need who who said that the girls have panties so you want also to think about the panty so she thought about a period panty because it's wow. for me not just the panty it's the concept behind you want to make sure that you give people access access to uh resources in a way that they can use not in a way that you create more problems for them but also uh the idea of uh, big girl was that giving people access to products it's not enough because you manage your body but what about the knowledge behind it why do you menstruate how can you manage your menstruation because also there is so many things around menstruation and self self esteem that girls really stay behind so you want to bring this conversations so when i found big and i was like oh my gosh this is a perfect opportunity for me to continue promoting change it's not in political here but it's okay siria it's about social change <laughs> and i felt like the education side was very important for me yeah. so i actually started working a lot on like improving the workshops in improving the trainings of trainers and we started having also different partners who would like see that oh this work that these ladies are doing is meaningful and then we had this um organization that decided that they wanted to invest in educating people but for that we needed age so they knew that bigel was a very nice uh and committed enterprise uh doing a great work so uh we went through this selection process and they chose people to develop uh the curriculum and i was proudly very 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 much involved in a personal level <laughs> because <laughs> i was in for education and i was like oh my god we are doing something for the government of mozambique i don't trust my government most of the times and now i have an opportunity to do things on our way yeah. in a way that young people will have access to it in a way that is very fun interesting interactive so i just like dived in and uh i i worked hardly day night along with uh my colleagues to make sure that we would deliver the best and we had to like research a lot talk to many people try the content have open conversations because conversations around menstruations are still taboo not only in Mozambique i mean in the world in general there are differences there are people that believe yeah. certain in a certain part of the world in other parts they believe other things so yeah. that was a very interesting um work because also when we talk about menstrual hygiene management you will see that people will always try to tell you what is the best way for you to manage your own menstruation they don't give you enough access to uh choices so for me this choice dictatorship it's something that i don't like i think women are different and they should have um solutions based on their reality there are people that if you give them a reusable pad they don't have water in the community then they have to choose between drinking water and washing the pad yeah. so there is a yeah. but if you tell them also here is the disposable pad then they have the pad for this cycle then there is no pad for other cycle and also yeah. you know that uh, we are having these conversations around climate change around environment protecting mm -hmm. environment you want friendly um and friend i don't know how we say that in in english but you want to make sure that you're not creating more problems to the environment mm -hmm. so giving using disposable pads can create a comfort today but can create a problem for future generations so there is all of these conversations around uh menstruation around the the educational side but also the products you will also find people especially men and other women who will say oh no this type of product it's not good for you because they feel like they own women's body and they can be saying what is good or bad for women so you also want to talk about men 
and tell them that it's okay for a girl to menstruate she's not sick and uh let her be top of her own body and her, her own game she has to make decisions that are better for her so the good thing about big l is that we didn't not we didn't just work with young girls or women in general it was also focused on men so uh the three years that i spent at big l were one of the best ones in my professional life but of course activism it's calling me all the time so i need to make a serious <laughs> <laughs> no how we are glad you're, in, you're on this part because you're also making an impact um just a quick one on the big girl the mestra hygiene curriculum this material these resources is it actually open is it an open source like people from other countries or other organizations that are actually working with girls maybe in rural community or urban community, whichever, can actually access this curriculum to also do their training. Is it open or it just for Mozambicas in a uh, Ugombe's voice? <laughs> By the time I was leaving, um, yeah. they were like having um, uh, partnerships with um, UNFPA in Angola. So... Okay. I think that these it's the content is not restricted just for mozambique but of course i think if other countries want to reproduce it then there's this long process that people have to go through but if uh they just need the content then there are other curriculums that there is a curriculum actually that it's like um an open source i think people can okay check uh big girls website if it's not there then uh try to find uh the email address of big girl even on facebook there is like big girl mozambique or big girl like we'll find like the global uh accounts they can like uh, send messages send emails and uh they will get the answers that they need i would say go for it you will find whatever you're looking for if it's a content things like that you will find and also the good thing is that big girl is just not in it's not only in mozambique it's in other countries too so maybe people wow. want to there are uh, initiatives or partners of big girl that they can collaborate with so since i'm not at big girl anymore i would say yeah. it's better to go to the social uh social media accounts and uh yeah. find try to send a message they can say that they saw a conversation with cdr and i know uh my colleagues they are still all my friends they will be very happy to assist yeah thank you so much for that resourceful information I know people that are actually very, very interested in girls and menstrual hygiene. Definitely mm. take advantage of it. Reach out to Big Girl on social media and ask your question. I'm very sure you'll get your desired answers. So um, let me ask you, Cynthia. You know, we've been serious. We've been having this very, very serious conversation about campaign. What do you, so what do you love? Yeah, like what do you love most about your job first? Before I ask another serious question. Like okay. what do you love most about being an activist? <sighs> the fact that I can influence change, that's something very interesting for me because without action, you don't have reaction. And yeah. most of the times when I do something, then I get a result. So I think that it's something that makes me happy and also seeing that i'm contributing for something that other people have started the the fight for rights didn't start with me it started with other yeah. people and if i can like just build one step it always make me feel good make me feel that i have a meaning uh, there is a meaning i am somehow necessary uh, because I'm using the life that I have to give back. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah I, yeah, I like that feeling. And also because activism has allowed me to do something that I love, which is travel and connect to people. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and you're also a very, very good. Um, you, you don't just campaign about social issues. Another thing I love about you, see, guys, the way you sell your country. Like, you just meet somebody and say, have you been to Mozambique before? Oh, these are the beautiful beaches. Uh -uh. 
Sidi, calm down. <laughs> like the way you spell your country, like visit Mozambique. Like, like you are like a true ambassador of your country, and that's really nice. Like, I didn't know about the beautiful beaches of Mozambique until I met you. And the way I remember, there was this thing. You posted a video on the group, and I had to post it on my own status. And somebody was like, "Did you travel yet?" So I said, "No, <laughs> I traveled through the lens of somebody." Like, it is actually very, very beautiful. And I, Mozambique is a yeah, it's a beautiful place. It's um, it's a, it's also a very good tourist um, tourist location. So for those that want to explore and travel, I think it's also good. Thank you so much once again, Cynthia. It's like it has been a pleasure having a conversation with you. So, so my last very serious question before we go to the next segment of our chat with the Facebook Live series. Um, so you, one of your big dreams actually to set up schools. Because I know we have a lot of young people. You might not know you have a lot of mentees with this life cut across the, the continent and the globe. People that look up to you, they want to do what you're doing, they want to influence change. And you said you want to set up a school. That's one big dream. So let me ask if I know it is still an idea, but you don't you never can tell who is going to listen and who wants to invest in your school. <laughs> So, can you just tell us about, like, I love the concept because you are going to raise people who know that this is what I live for. And the mm. beautiful thing, when I saw it, what actually, um, what actually um, multi, um, inspired me about your idea is the fact that it is not enough to know what to do, it is how to do it. And mm. I think this is going to show young people how to do it, the right way to do it, to influence both social and political change. And that, that, is, that is very amazing, that's beautiful. So can you, can you just tell us, so this big concept in your head, so how is it going to be like? We, we can never tell, somebody might be here that wants to invest in this school. <laughs> that's very interesting because we didn't talk about it today actually. Um, yeah. In 2019, Mm -mm. 2015, I was just 19 years old and I started a, a, a project that then became, uh, a, a, let's say, kind of, of a business, a formal business, mm -hmm. training people. And I saw that that was very interesting. I was training people on leadership, social intervention, professional posture, and also entrepreneurship. And I started seeing that we do have many people out and inside the market, but also like random people who want to become better citizens, but they don't, ha they, they don't know how to do it. So it made me uh, reinforce the idea that education is really important. And I always yeah. dreamed that like one day, if I get opportunities, like for people to do great, they have to get access to tools, they have to get access to information, they have to get access to knowledge. If one day I have the money, for sure, I will do that. But meanwhile, I continue training people, training, training, training. And it's what I do, regardless of the area that uh, I'm working on. I will continue to like uh, train people. And then yeah. regarding the fellowship particularly, um, one of the last uh, sentences that you had was like, she wants to establish an activism school. Yeah. First, because I feel like we have to prepare better citizens to be able to serve our countries. The same way I think we, we need like uh, a school for governments. <laughs> this is a joke. We don't need a school for governments because who gets yeah. in the government are also normal people. So if yeah. we try, well, everyone have like aligned in terms of values, in terms of principles, in terms of what is necessary, then we will of course and organically have better people in our governments too, but you will also have and let's say the rest of the society will be also very prepared to uh, confront the same government will be very prepared to suggest new ways of acting when you have uh, like when you you leading people they that they don't know their rights they don't know anything to say they don't have anything to say they don't have opinions they don't have anything it's even hard and doesn't challenge you as a leader so we need yeah. to challenge our leaders to be able to make better jobs because most of the times they are convinced things that they, thinking that they are doing a great job but they are not the only things that people are not talking to them they are, people are not telling them enough what they have yeah. here so it's very important for me 
to make sure that I don't like the idea to just blame people saying, oh no, you're not doing enough. I like to say, you're not doing enough. Here is what you need to do enough. And then I can be in a position to say that now you're not doing anything. So I believe that it's really, really, really important for us. Most of the things that I learned as an activist, as a campaigner, I had to read books. And people think that I am an organic activist. No. Every time I would try a different tactic, a different strategy, I would fail. And then I would just go back and read. Ah, okay. So this is the best way to address the government when they do such a lot, lot, lot. This is the best way to do innovative ways, blah, blah, blah. So I believe that if I had to go research, do stuff, thinking of creating like um, innovative uh, hashtags, things like that, people have to study. Many struggles are documented. So you want to go and read this thing so that you can apply in your context. You can try something. So definitely it's very important for me to have a space where people can go get trained on how to be good citizens to be able to demand accountability. <laughs> Sepai's voice. Oh, really? Like, <laughs> if you're not going to mention that, I was, I was, at the end of it, I said accountability and transparency. You yeah, need to I, mention we have to be accountable. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, CD. Uh, oh, really? Guys, in front of me. No worry, Ines is not yet, so you are very, very, very safe. So Ines is not yet, so you're very safe. So thank you so much once again, Cydia, for coming live to share this amazing work you're doing and how you're impacting and creating change. Super, super amazing. So if you are someone that actually desires to become an activist or you're thinking of running a campaign or you want to do something to just, you want to influence social or political change, I think um, CJ is a very, very busy person. I said that, I said same thing with Nyanga yesterday. But don't worry, if you just reach out, drop your message. Last, last, they will definitely respond to it. So what? if you just need, yeah. Yeah, one day they'll respond to your message. So if you need um you need support, you need help in maybe how to go about it. Because she she's somebody that's very, very passionate about what she's doing. You can see just from the way she's talking, you will know this lady is activist, activist divine. It is inside of her. So if it is something you're looking at starting or you're looking at doing. Um, so you could just drop her a message, just reach out to her, and also you can follow her. I know some of her posts is actually in Portuguese. Like I, I was watching one of your videos. I was like, what is she saying? <laughs> <laughs> Where is the translation? Like, you understand? Like, what is she saying? Let's, let's like it. We know she's representing us. Let's like it. We don't understand. But mm -hmm. I think some of her posts, there's this direct translation to English. So you could also follow her. Definitely, I know for one, you'll learn one or two things following Cydia. She's a super, super amazing lady. So... Gang, gang, gang. This is another segment I like. We have to do it. Yeah. So it's your MWMS <laughs> Yeah. So CJ is an MWF fellow 2022. She was also placed at Kansas State University. So I had the honor of spending six amazing weeks with, with CJ. And guess what? Like we started our journey together from the airport to Ono's house. Mm. We started it together, yeah. So, and guess what? Like, I am the honored person that chose Cedias to be Cedias guardian angel. So, I mean, Cedias like, and we are in each other's life. So, Cedias, tell me something. So, how was your MWF experience? So, share okay. your experience with us. Uh, how much time do I have to answer that? Oh, oh, you want me to time you? No, don't worry. Um, I think we just, we have nine more minutes to go. We are already into our extra time. Okay, okay. So I think okay. For your entire M, yeah. For your entire MWF experience. So I just asked you what. So maybe what you will say, we have, we, okay. Do you want me to just ask you all the questions so that you answer at once? Uh, I think it depends on you because I wanted to talk about my biggest takeaways from the fellowship. Okay, yes. So, okay. Just, just go ahead. Share your experience and your biggest takeaways. Okay. Please, go ahead. So, I don't have to say that the experience was great, obviously. Like, every time we change environments, there is something 
that change with us whether we like it or not it's like oh. when you when it's raining and then you go to the rain and then you expect to come back dry that's not possible if yeah. you expect yourself to other people to add their views to other ways of thinking perspective there is something that's going to change uh with you as well so this is one of my theories of life I have to keep exposing myself to other contexts. So going and spending six weeks, that was the first time in my life that I spent more than 15 days out of my country. I normally don't like I, I can go somewhere, but I want to go back and still missing the place. I don't want to go to exhausting that place, like all my energies. But for some reason, uh, when I left Kansas, I st still had energy. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> And um, yeah, in, the, in, in six weeks, my biggest, yeah. the first one, the concept of giving back. I have been always, I like to help people, but I didn't have clear why is it that I was doing it. And today I have a name for it. It's giving back because um, you're, it's a way also for me to express gratitude for the life that we have and the resources that we have. Um, so seeing many people really engaged in volunteer work, helping others, regardless of their ages, uh, young people, elders, old people, we say elders, we say elders. Like Senior citizens. Senior citizens. So that was very interesting uh, for me to see. So that concept that it's very important to continuously give back. And um, the second thing that I learned, I didn't learn from anyone specifically, but I learned from the experience that we had. And I realized that it's always important to do the right thing, even if it's hard. Because when I look back and I see the way uh, our leadership in the continent is failing. It's not because we don't have wide and like wise and smart people in the continent. No, we don't have all of that. Mm -hmm. Resources, we don't have people, we have everything. But there is something that's ruining our success is that even knowing what is the right thing, we always prefer to do the wrong thing. So I decided yeah. to, like from today on, this will guide me whenever i feel like in doubt of what to do i will just do the right thing because most of the times we do know what is the right thing we just like yeah. choose so the experience that i had made me realize that that it's very very important to do the right thing and also the concept of stepping back was very important for me as well because um I always thought that it's it's very important to give for our for other people give give our life for something that we believe uh do it like in a way that we feel <sighs> i'm looking for words in english <sighs> this language things anyway so i learned so that I can help you. even if we want to take care of other people we have to mm. think if we are really helping them or making them depend on us or are we really addressing the problem or we're just doing what we think that it's necessary and we are not like really observing really analyzing what is crucial so like step back it's something that is helping me a lot other thing is that um whenever we we are challenged with any situation we have to question our first interpretation <laughs> and think about other different ways of thinking and um yeah. the, the the example that comes in my mind it's the one from our colleagues getting on a public transportations meeting yeah. like people and then seeing them wearing masks and then yeah. trying to understand why is it that they decided to only wear their masks when they saw uh, our colleagues and we were like oh no it's racism and then others were like oh no maybe they were comfortable by themselves or maybe oh no they want to protect our colleagues so that yeah. for me 
very interesting because as a leader, if we don't do that, if we don't put that doubt, if we don't dig in to find um, other ways of thinking, we can make decisions based on wrong assumptions. So yeah. that was great. And also the difference between the facts and the interpretations as well. Was yeah. Something like because I always thought that I'm too wise, I'm too smart, and I trust everything that I think. But now I'm, <laughs> I have to always think twice. Whatever I'm thinking, is it a fact or is it just interpretation? So that concept was very present for me. And maybe the last, the last thing, since we have two minutes, the way we change narratives, and it comes yeah. on my the example of uh, the restrooms that I we we found when we went to the zoo, that on the male toilets we had this thing to change diapers, and uh, in our heads only women can change diapers. And then Gatund was sharing that that he was like surprised seeing that in the male yeah. restroom there is this thing. So as an activist, it was very important for me to understand that oh, you can actually change and shift narratives even without saying anything and letting people think and make and get their own conclusions so yeah this is one of my biggest takeaways from the fellowship wow that's like it's like it's super packed it's super packed takeaways like you know what i'm just thinking there's i'm still going to call you back like <laughs> i i'm i'm thinking yes like i'm thinking of something let me okay. just share it i'm thinking of something i'm thinking of just and as many people that are available, let's just come and share these concepts that we learned. Like you, you talked about impact and intent. You talked about it just slightly. And you talked about interpretation and fact. That is where we do the observe and interpret. And those are like serious concepts that we need to talk about and share. Those are part of the learnings we actually, we are not different people. Now, when I see something, I don't just take it as surface value and just judge as though this is the conclusion. No, we need to state it. Is it a fact or is it an assumption? Or mm. are you misinterpreting it? So I think, yeah, I think you will still come back. You and some other fellows, people will just come back. We just have like this general conversation. Yes, I'm going yeah. to work on something. Yeah, it yeah. might not be on Facebook or it might be on LinkedIn or something, but I just know that we're just going to create this platform. Let's just share so that other people could actually learn from our learning. Thank you so much once again, Cynthia. I can keep you here for the next one hour because you're super exciting. Like it's, like it's a very, very exciting and very informative conversation we've had so far. I've learned a lot just listening to you talk and talk about what you're so passionate about. And do you know what I love the most about all of these conversations that we've had? Like even when you're afraid, you keep pushing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, like that is one profound thing. So we don't, like my conclusion is, I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to be confident in it. I don't have to feel safe in it. As long as it's the right thing, I will do it afraid. I do it shaking. I just keep on pushing. Thank you so much, Cydia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Cydia, for sharing that with us this evening. And I don't know, do you have anything to add? Because usually I ask people, what's a big dream for Africa? What's a big dream for your country? You've shared a lot on that already. So no. my final... Dorcas, for what you're doing. It's like very interesting. You know, when you're talking, sometimes you remember certain things and you can like live experiences that you had in the past. So I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, so I know I'm going to work on something. I'll bring you back. So my final, final, final question to you, Cynthia. So Cynthia, what is your advice to us as a continent? Now, I'm not asking for your big dream for the continent. You said that. It's peace. So, like, what is your advice for our African youth? So that would be our closing. Okay, so my dream for the continent is to see an independent continent where people live with dignity. This is like far away from the reality right now. Uh, a continent where we have peace because now it's like every country has conflicts. So I, I really wish that we didn't go through all of these things. 
and we have like fair governments because our leaders they are like messing it all i wish i won't say what i wanted to say because there are two sides of the coin even if we change the governments today we have to make sure that us we are prepared to go there and do the right thing and not to replicate the same mistakes that other people were doing this is one of the biggest concerns that I, i i do have so i do have these dreams and my final advice to young people let's do the right thing i know it's hard let's let's try to do the right thing i won't say much because if we have this concept we know that our actions will be guided and oriented by a very high value and we cannot go wrong if we do right things of course there are implications but we lose more when we choose to do the wrong thing rather than yeah. doing thing so that would be my 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 thing um i would 